Hey guys, welcome back to the show. And on this episode, I'm going to be talking about a movie that apparently has a cult following, and I have no idea why. I never want to watch this movie ever again. I am so relieved to be past that point in the video making process. Process? It's Clifford, starring Martin Short, Charles Grodin, and Mary Steenburgen. Now, this is one of those movies that I think really fits in with this show because it's extremely weird. And I'm not just talking about the story, I mean everything about it. Now, don't get me wrong, I mean, I think Martin Short is a national treasure. I find a lot of his stuff hilarious, but in this movie, he's playing a child. And I don't think I've ever seen a movie that's tried to pass off a 40 year old man as a 10 year old boy. Most of the time when you're watching this movie, you kind of forget that and it just feels like you're watching a movie where Charles Grodin's character hates Martin Short's character. And then all of a sudden you realize, oh yeah, this is supposed to be a kid. So the movie starts in the future at a place for troubled young boys run by Father Clifford. And this movie was supposed to be like a slapstick black comedy, but I didn't find the script funny in the slightest. However, Martin Short has this ability to make things funny even without saying anything, either by uh, his physical comedy or just by his facial expressions. Was a little, little man and a little, little man was he. He climbed up to a sycamore. Oh. Uh. Who's Can you just act like a human boy for one minute here? Look at me like a person. You can't do it for more than a few seconds. Look at me like a human boy. Don't mess around with me. So Father Clifford starts talking to a young Ben Savage and tells him all about the terrible child he once was. And now we go back to when Clifford was a child who looked like a middle-aged man and he's just being a pain in the ass because I don't know, we never really find out why he's just a psychopath. All he wants is to visit the Dinosaur World theme park in California, but the plane his family is on is going to Hawaii for his dad's business trip. So he decides to just mess around with the controls in the cockpit so that they have to make an emergency landing in Los Angeles. Meanwhile, Clifford's uncle, Martin, an architect currently designing a transit system for LA, buys a brand new house and shows his fiance, who hates it because she really wants kids and the house only has one bedroom. So she threatens to break up with him because she thinks he doesn't want kids. I can't believe what I'm hearing, Sarah. I, I, I love kids. Oh, you don't. I saw you at the daycare today. Oh, no, no, no. You're talking about other people's children. You should see me with a kid I know. You know, my own flesh and blood. My nephew. You never mentioned you had a nephew. I love my nephew. Of course, they won't let Clifford back onto another plane to Hawaii because, you know, there's probably a no-fly list for people who try to crash a plane. So his dad comes up with the idea of getting his brother, who he never really talks to, to look after Clifford for a week. And isn't this just the perfect coincidence? Now Martin can show his fiance how good he is with kids. Of course, you already know what's going to happen before it happens. Clifford's gonna end up driving him insane, leading to some ridiculous conclusion. But you could probably tell that by just looking at the poster. I mean, this says it all right here. This single image is like 99% of the movie. So Martin picks him up from the airport and somehow Clifford is able to convince him to take all of this luggage that isn't his, like a surfboard, stereo, a dog, and somehow no one noticed this, which can only mean one thing, that airport security was even worse back then, which actually doesn't surprise me. I mean, before 9-11, it was just a free-for-all. So they arrive at his current house, I assume, and Clifford goes right into the bathroom where Sarah is taking a shower and scares her with his dinosaur. Honestly, I think at this point, I would be calling my brother just to confirm that this person is actually my nephew and not some 40-year-old pervert posing as him. Th that was Clifford. Who the hell is Clifford? My nephew, Clifford. Remember, I was just telling you about him. Your nephew's here? So wait, he didn't tell his fiance 
that his nephew was going to be staying with them for a week before he went and picked him up. And don't give me the whole, oh, well, she was probably in the shower. It takes two seconds, you know, open the door. Hey, honey, uh, there's an emergency. My nephew needs to stay with us for a week. That's it. It's five seconds. Just seems like something you might want to mention, you know, especially if you're in a serious, committed relationship. They always say communication is key, which, you know, is why I've just been alone for so long because I just hate communicating. So this is where Clifford is introduced to Sarah. And again, it's funny because not only are you watching grown adults act in a scene where another grown adult is supposed to be a child, but for fun, just think about this. Martin Short was 40 when they were shooting this and Mary Steedbergen was 37. So she's actually younger than the person playing the 10 year old child. <laughs> and I know some people out there be like, um, excuse me, it's acting. Older people play younger people all the time. Yes, I understand that. I just think it's very funny when you think about that this is supposed to be an actual child and it's, it's being played by an adult who's older than the person who's an adult playing the adults. This movie is just so bizarre for so many reasons because the thing is, the illusion of Martin Short being a kid never actually really sells. So sometimes it feels like this is a movie where the character is actually an adult pretending to be a kid in the movie, if that makes sense. It's almost like that would actually make more sense if that was the case. Like if this was a movie where Martin Short was playing a character who had to pretend to be this guy's nephew for whatever reason, which I know sounds like pretty you know, oddball and goofy, but is it really that much more goofy than what this is? Like, let's say he wanted to prove to his fiance that he was good with kids and he just blurted something out like, well, I'm great with kids. You know, I have this nephew and we get along great. And she was like, okay, well, I want to meet him. And he was just kind of caught in the lie. Like, oh crap, uh, okay, sure. And then he asked his buddy, you know, like, hey, you got to pretend to be my nephew for a week, man and there was some kind of deal, you know? <laughs> Do you get what I'm saying here? <laughs> I know for a fact that some of you totally get where I'm coming from. Like, you can see that movie, can't you? It probably wouldn't have Charles Grodin in it. It would probably be someone like Kevin James and the kid or the nephew might be like Kevin Hart, you know, really throw a wrench in it. I'm not saying that would be a good movie. I'm just saying that you could, you could see that making more sense than this situation. Although this is actually kind of, I guess that's kind of part of the charm of this movie, if there is any charm. Maybe I'm starting to understand why this has a cult following. I'll still never watch it again though. Honestly, that situation where a guy had to get his buddy to pretend to play his nephew, it actually feels like that sometimes in this movie just because of the way they interact. Any luck with that chocolate? Any luck with that chocolate? Any luck with that chocolate? And that's the thing, it would almost be too disturbing to have an actual kid uh, in this role because a lot of these interactions are just too harsh. I don't believe what I'm hearing either. <laughs> <laughs> oh, honey, be careful while you eat your cereal. Use a napkin. This boy and his cereal. <laughs> <laughs> So the movie enters into this weird, like, limbo comedy purgatory where some of this stuff is only funny because it's an adult playing a kid. But it's also really weird at the same time. The rest of this movie is really just Clifford taking part in a variety of mischief from mere pranks to life-threatening situations, but we never really get any kind of explanation as to why he's like this. So he just comes off as a complete psychopath, hell-bent on ruining this man's life completely until Martin either kills him or takes him to the stupid dinosaur theme park. I think that's really the only explanation as to why he's like this. He's just so insanely spoiled that instead of being just a brat up front, he'd rather be super manipulative and ruin your life. So Martin has to redesign the whole transit system in two days and the movie keeps coming back to the fact that because he has to keep dealing with all of Clifford's garbage, he's running out of time to get all the work done. And I know I've talked about this before but I just want to mention it again. I always love this plot device, the ticking clock. 
because even if it's not creating immediate suspense, you know that at least the story is leading up to something. It's not just gonna, you know, fart out. So Clifford convinces Martin that he's running away and taking a train to San Francisco and tricks Martin into getting on that train and actually going there. Meanwhile, he throws a huge house party, which I'm sorry, it's gonna sound like I'm nitpicking here, but this makes absolutely no sense. How would he get all of these people to come to this house in such a short amount of time? He's 10 and he's not even from that city. And also this is before the internet, so it's not like you can just throw out a party invitation to the entire world. But whatever, Martin of course finds out and is understandably pissed off. So he comes home to find Clifford all tied up. I don't know, I guess he did this himself somehow. So he boards up the door to Clifford's room. Sarah comes home and is shocked by this whole thing. So she takes Clifford away. Now Martin realizes that he's gotta do his presentation for the transit system at work but he can't find the tape anywhere. After tearing apart the house, he finds it taped under a dresser drawer. And again, what the hell? How would Clifford even know what he was doing for work? And furthermore, how would he know which tape to hide? Anyways, Martin gets to the presentation and here we go. He puts in the tape and the entire display explodes. What? All right, out of all the things I just talked about that don't make any sense, this one takes the cake easily. Does this mean that Clifford put in some kind of code to trigger an explosion? So there's explosives inside of the display for some reason? Come on, whatever. Martin has pretty much gone postal at this point, so he kidnaps Clifford. And I don't blame him because I would want to kill anyone playing the recorder while I was trying to sleep. Seriously, I remember having to learn how to play the recorder it was like for a few months in grade eight and I'll never forget that because we all had to buy new recorders. They were like four bucks or whatever. And we all had to sit there and play in unison like the same song. And I just remember the sound and looking at the teacher like, Jesus Christ, why would you subject yourself to this? Anyways, Martin puts Clifford in a straitjacket and takes him to Dinosaur World, which quite honestly looks like a pretty badass theme park. I can see why he wanted to go there so much. Of course, since Martin helped design the main attraction, he's able to get in after hours and decides to torture Clifford by putting him on the T-Rex roller coaster and making it go faster and faster. This, of course, causes the whole thing to malfunction and Clifford has to hang on for dear life until Martin saves him from falling into the robotic dinosaur's mouth. And I guess this changes Clifford? I don't know why. Seems pretty tame compared to all the other stuff where he almost died. Almost crashing a car. Almost crashing a plane. So Martin is like, whatever kid, do what you want, I don't care. And Clifford realizes he actually cares what Uncle Martin thought about him. Again, I don't really know why, but who cares? The movie's almost over. Anyways, Sarah and Martin get married with Clifford as the ring bearer, and Martin reluctantly gives Clifford a kiss on the cheek, which Clifford says was a sign that he had forgiven him. Uncle Martin had forgiven me. I'm sorry, but it doesn't look like he had forgiven him. I mean, just, just look at his face. He, he clearly doesn't want to do this. And why was that the act of kindness that changed your life? How about the act of kindness of him letting you stay at his house for a week after you committed a felony? How about that act of kindness? Now, this movie was shot in 1990, but wasn't released until 1994, because at the time, Orion Pictures had suffered so many losses on movies over the years that by 1991 they actually filed for bankruptcy and this delayed the release of a lot of movies including this one but still when this movie was released it didn't do well at all but i mean i guess in the end it gained a cult following which i guess i kind of understand but still I don't want to watch it again. But there's a lot of these movies where someone meets someone else who ends up driving them crazy. One of my all-time favorites, and I would recommend this movie a million times over, is What About Bob? 
with Bill Murray and Richard Dreyfuss. What About Bob, in my opinion, is such a well-written comedy. It's one of those comedies that it has a bunch of little funny details and subtleties from a performance perspective that I didn't really notice when I was a kid, but I see them now as an adult. So it's like I've gained a new appreciation for it. It's just a great movie. I always loved it as a kid and I love it even more now as an adult. So if you haven't seen What About Bob, I definitely recommend checking it out. But that's pretty much it for this one. As usual, thanks for watching guys and I'll see you all next time. Charles Grodin, of course, played the father in the Beethoven movies. Probably a joke to be made about, you know, Clifford, dog, Clifford the big red dog, maybe. I don't know, I couldn't come up with anything good though. It's like the Stone Age somewhere in this building, banging on mallets and hammers and moving boulders. That's what it sounds like. Probably someone just like, you know, moving a chair. It's a lot of dust on that fan. Why does it get so, Jesus Christ, it's like a sweater up there. All right, Mark, start getting, stop getting distracted and get back to recording the show. Um, am I recording? Yeah, okay, good. <laughs>